Um, today, uh, we have invited um, Professor Tadeusz Metz, and he is a distinguished professor at the University of Johannesburg, and he is the author of the book Meaning in Life, an analytic study. This is a book. Um, this book was published in uh, 2013 by Oxford University Press. Um, and I believe this is a very important book uh, in this field. And this is a philosophy book which deals with many a wide range of topics concerning uh, meaning in life. Um, this is a must-read book for researchers and students who are interested in this field. So um, first, how many years did you spend for finishing all, all, all of these chapters? Um, I began thinking uh, seriously about the meaning of life from a mm -hmm. philosophical perspective mm -hmm. in 1998 and wrote a first short paper in 1999. Mm -hmm. And then it was really in 2000, 2001 that I began writing. Um, and each individual chapter I wrote, I envisioned as being part of a, mm -hmm. a, a larger collection. Oh, yes. And since, as you pointed out, the book was published in 2013, mm -hmm. it, it took me about 15 years. Oh, that's a very long and big, huge project. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, in this book, uh, you argued uh, that there are three approaches to meaning in life, and that is a supernaturalism, and subjectivism, and objectivism. And your own view, the fundamental theory, fundamentality theory, is a, I think, a kind of object, objectivistic theory. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to uh, ask you about first the supernaturalism, and. You write uh, in your book that supernaturalism is the general view that what constitutes or is at least necessary for meaning in life is a relationship with a spiritual realm. Spiritual realm. So um, I would like to ask you about this uh, spiritual realm, and you talk you talk a lot about God in monotheistic religion but there are a variety of religions <coughs> on the earth, mm. and among which there are various um, polytheistic religions. Mm. For example, in India, or Japan, or ancient China, mm. Greece, ancient Greece, and some parts of Africa, mm. and nations, perhaps, uh, many people believed, or now still believe, that there are many gods mm. in this world. Mm. And also, even people like me, <laughs> me, mm -hmm. <laughs> And who are agnostic, I am an agnostic person, and do not necessarily believe in a particular religion. Mm -hmm. But even me, sometimes I can feel religious atmosphere or religious, I don't know, <laughs> or spiritual something, spiritual realm. So when my, for example, when, when my close friends died, um, I felt he was still there, here around me. Mm -hmm. uh, for some time after his death. So I think this is a kind of spiritual phenomenon, um, <coughs> at least for me. So my first question is, so is it really possible to clearly distinguish supernaturalism from naturalism? Yeah, so uh, what, what do you think about this? Um, so in this book, I'm working mainly within the Western tradition. Mm -hmm. Gave me enough to think about for those fifteen years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when I think of the supernatural as opposed to the natural, I'm doing it in largely monotheistic terms. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the spiritual would be something like a, a, a monotheistic god mm -hmm. uh, or a soul that lives forever uh, mm -hmm. and can live uh, uh, disembodied, mm -hmm. uh, survives after the, the deaths of these bodies. Um, so that would be a supernatural view, would say that we need uh, either God or a soul, or usually both, mm -hmm. in order to have uh, meaning in our lives. Mm -hmm. As you point out, there are lots of other uh, religious approaches uh, uh, beyond uh, Christianity, mm -hmm. Islam, or Judaism uh, that have been prominent in the West. Um, 
But I think probably a lot of the points I make in respect of Western supernaturalism mm -hmm. will apply to these other views as well. So the alternative to a supernaturalist approach is a naturalist one, and it says even if there were no spiritual realm, however you really want to define that, however, mm -hmm. uh, whatever might populate it, um, whether it's forces or agents, but whatever that realm is that's beyond the reach of the scientific method, mm -hmm. roughly speaking, mm -hmm. is going to count as supernatural. Um, I think it would be nice for meaning in our lives if there were such a realm. Uh, it would be nice to be able to reunite with my father, for example, yeah. in an afterlife. But I don't think it's essential uh, for a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the key claim I make in the book. And one argument uh, for mm -hmm. this position uh, is that we imagine right now there's nothing spiritual that exists. There's no God, no heaven, nothing else that we might want to define as, as spiritual. And then we ask ourselves, are some lives meaningful? And it seems to me, yes, some are. Uh, in fact, many are. Mm -hmm. uh, and some are more meaningful than others. Mm -hmm. um, and there are various things we can do in our lives to make them more meaningful as opposed to less meaningful. Um, so a life without a god or a soul or any other spiritual realm might not be as desirable mm -hmm. uh, as a supernatural one, or one that had a supernatural dimension. But there's still something worth living for uh, and something worth striving for and something that should guide our choices uh, in day-to-day -day life uh, so that they, our lives become more meaningful rather than less. Okay, uh, so can I understand that you know, the opposite concept of supernaturalism is a kind of scientific worldview or mm. something similar to this? Yes, that's the main, that's the main contrast that mm. I draw in the book. Okay, so um, as you know, um, for example, in East Asian countries like China or Japan, so there are many, many people who uh, wish to re reunite with their um, deceased mm. fathers, mothers, and those family members. Yes. So, uh, so this is a um, um, kind of a, a very uh, strong characteristic of uh, East Asian religions, I think. So, um, do you have some um, ideas or some? Uh, that's okay. So, do you think um, they feel? Uh, meaning in life in East Asian countries is a little bit different from those of European, American, not in, not in that respect. I mean, mm -hmm. I think part of the motivation for believing in a soul is the wish or the hope to reunite with loved ones mm -hmm. uh, after they die. Uh, I think that's that's true for Westerners uh, Okay, so there's no difference. I don't think in, in that respect, uh, no. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I think uh, this is clear, could it become, becomes clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the next, I, um, I would like to ask you your theory, fundamentality theory. Um, your basic statement, statement is uh, this, a human person's life is more meaningful uh, the more that she employs her reason and in ways that positively orient rationality towards fundamental conditions of human existence. So you here you uh, stress the, the importance of uh, rationality and how uh, a person uses or employs his or her rationality. Um, I have some questions and the first one is uh, you argue that you can compare meaningfulness of life among people. And you argue that the life of Ma Mandela or Mother Teresa is more meaningful than the lives of absurd men or women who watch TV all day, mm -hmm. drinking beer or doing <laughs> um, TV games. Right. Like. So, yes, I understand what you mean. Mm. Mm, but I have the intuition that there is a core in meaning in life, and this core cannot be compared with each other. So, um, so this is my hope, you know. <laughs> I, I want, I wish there should be a core in, 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 in meaning of life which should not be compared. So, um, yeah, so, okay, so first, 
uh, what do you do? Do you still uh, what do how do you think about um idea like mine? So there, there is a, there should be an a aspect which should not be compared with anything. Do you mean it should not be compared, or that it cannot be compared? Oh, cannot be. Cannot, cannot be. be. Yes. But this is one one aspect. Mm. So um, my argument is, you know, <coughs> the meaning meaning in life as a whole cannot be compared. Mm. My yeah, this is not my argument. My argument is there there is one aspect mm. which cannot be compared with other person's meaning in life. Mm. I think I'm open to the idea that everybody's mm. subjectivity is unique. So yeah. Everybody has a distinct point of view. Mm -hmm. um, they're in their own space time mm -hmm. and they have their own histories. Um, and there are all sorts of particular uh, facts about their, their social situation mm -hmm. that, uh, in some sense, makes everybody uh, uh, different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and one might find that to be special. Mm -hmm to think, well, that's part of what it is to be a person, and persons mm -hmm. have a dignity or some kind of incomparable value. Yes. Um, and so from that, from that perspective, I'm, I'm, I think I'm willing to accept that there are values, um, important values, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are incomparable. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps for being utterly unique, perhaps for being a matter of being a person which has a dignity and mm -hmm. we might not want to trade off uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, amongst yeah, uh, yes. the dignity of individuals. Mm -hmm. So that those things make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I myself wouldn't call them considerations of meaning, however. Mm -hmm. um, so when I talk about what makes a life meaningful, in particular I'm thinking about things that merit pride on mm -hmm. the part of oneself. Mm -hmm. or that it would make sense for others to admire about oneself. So I imagine uh, somebody's died and we are constructing a eulogy, and a eulogy would usually pick out um, uh, the meaningful aspects yes. of the person's life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but when we're looking at what merits pride on the part of the person or admiration on the part of others, we're not going to pick out the fact that, mm -hmm. oh, she was a, she was a person or she had a particular point of view, mm. um, uh, or she had a dignity like every other person. Mm. And when we're talking about meaning, at least in the sense that I use in that book, uh, it looks like we're essentially looking at something comparable, oh. something that can go up and down within mm -hmm. a life, mm -hmm. uh, and something that can vary between lives. Mm -hmm. I see. And I'm particularly interested in a sort of value that I can get more of in my life. Mm -hmm. So in the book, I wasn't particularly interested in providing guidance to people to help them choose uh, mm -hmm. one way rather than another. Um, uh, but I did want um, uh, a theory that could, at least in principle, provide that kind of guidance uh, mm -hmm. that would be addressing the sort of thing uh, yeah. that, that, mm -hmm. that, that was amenable uh, mm -hmm. to being uh, captured mm -hmm. uh, and improved. Mm -hmm. OK, I understand. But for me, um, still I uh, want to uh, shed light on the um, human dignity like mm -hmm. aspect of um, human's meaning. Mm -hmm. mm, so I will yeah, uh, continue to think about this. One, yeah. one thing I might say though is that it might be that what you're uh, pointing to is a precondition mm -hmm. for the sort of meaning that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So in order to uh, uh, have self-esteem for one's accomplishments, mm -hmm. One needs a self. Yes. Um, and part of what you are focusing on, I think, is, is mm -hmm. what it is to be a self. Yeah. A human self mm -hmm. or a personal self. Yes. Uh, but, I, but I still I would like to argue that, you know, mm -hmm. the existence of the self is itself kind of a meaning. Should, uh, might be. Uh, become a, not just not just the source of meaning, but mm -hmm. itself meaning, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but, but, but I think I have to clarify this point. Mm -hmm. And 
My second question is, um, so you uh, stress the importance of uh, rationality, but I, um, I'm just wondering, is the, the degree of employment or use of rationality is uh, measurable between people? So he, he, um, he employs his rationality uh, more than or other, other people. I think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, how, the, the how, one, how? the person who simply sunbathes mm -hmm. um, doesn't look like uh, he's using his reason at all. Uh, and so a life full of sunbathing would be one that didn't uh, involve but, but, the use but, but of there, intelligence. There, but, you know, but there might be uh, some hidden meaning, hidden um, use of rationality inside his head. There might be. You, might need, a, be. you need to tell a story, though. Right? <laughs> you need to explain... Uh -huh that it, it looks like he is still and simply soaking mm -hmm. in the sun, but he has all sorts of things going on in his head. So uh, you, would need to, you would need to tell me more about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, unless there is n no, not such additional explanation, mm -hmm. we should, it is okay for, for us to think that he did n does not employ his own rationality so much. It looks like it. Okay. Um, and then even within pe between people who mm -hmm. are uh, both exercising their intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, some will do it in a more sophisticated way, mm -hmm. some will practice and try uh, and uh, persevere, mm -hmm. um, others will have courage mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, overcome obstacles. Mm -hmm. And so in all these ways, um, uh, I think we can point to uh, situations in which there are greater or at least uh, more intricate or mm -hmm. more robust exercises of intelligence okay. than others. Okay. So um, my third question, this is the last one. Uh, this is about your current research. Mm -hmm. uh, last week um, in Tokyo, you gave us a um, presentation about African philosophy and how they have interpreted their meaning in life in their African traditions. And um, participants, including me, uh, felt that the concept of meaning in life in African philosophy resembles much that of Japanese people. Um, you uh, said in, in, in the meeting, uh, first, uh, African people have the communal theory of meaning, which is uh, a human person's life is more meaningful the longer, the stronger, the greater the number of relationships. And the second day, uh, African people have the vitalist theory of meaning. Uh, this is uh, a human, human person's life is more meaningful the more that she promotes dynamic creative energy in herself and others. Um, I love this, this second one very much. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, um, and you um, also point, pointed out that there are both the positive side and negative side. Uh, in this kind of uh, philosophy, in meaning of life, um, in their interpretations of meaning of life. Mm -hmm. So um, I think your comments are very, uh, was interesting and stimulating for me. Uh, so uh, what, what, do, you, do you have any uh, additional comment on yeah, your interpretation of African philosophy, um, especially about their meaning in life. Okay. So, uh, in the book, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. I focused uh, almost exclusively on the Western tradition mm -hmm. um, of thought about meaning. And uh, for a long time, while I was writing that book, mm -hmm. I was also doing work in African philosophy. Mm -hmm. But there, I wasn't looking at meaning in life, I was looking at morality. African views of, of right and wrong, mm -hmm. and just and unjust. Um, and these were separate projects uh, for uh, until very recently. Mm -hmm. um, so since the book, I've been wanting to explore uh, meaning as understood in other traditions, and it was natural for me to start uh, with the African tradition, mm -hmm. uh, the non-Western tradition that I've known best. Um, but as I said in my talk, uh, there isn't a real developed body of literature in African philosophy on the topic of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, it's become a literate tradition uh, only since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. We don't even have three generations of uh, sympathetic inquirers uh, uh, um, 
writing uh, uh, their scholarship down uh, on African philosophy. And so there are just a small handful of texts and suggestions uh, in the literature explicitly about uh, meaning from an African perspective. Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing is drawing on values that are salient mm -hmm. in uh, African ethics, um, which often have to do with personhood or what's known as virtue. Mm -hmm. um, and one becomes a real person or exhibits virtue for much of the African tradition, uh, uh, either insofar as one in increases one's vitality, uh, mm -hmm. becomes stronger, more creative, more powerful, um, or uh, insofar as one relates communally with others, mm -hmm. that is, shares a way of life with them or uh, goes out of one's way to help them. Um, those ideas have been common in thinking about virtue, and so uh, in, in recent work I've been transposing them to see, well, how well do they capture our thought about what makes a life meaningful, mm -hmm. that merits uh, pride or admiration roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and on the face of it, I think they do a good job. I think they are contenders uh, uh, that not merely those in the African tradition should consider, mm -hmm. uh, because there are uh, uh, resonances with uh, the East Asian tradition, and, and uh, even the Western tradition can find something attractive about mm -hmm. these views. Mm -hmm. So when Africans focus on uh, communal relationship, um, they're capturing what we find attractive, I think, about family and friends uh, and uh, co-workers um, and clubs and churches. Um, any sort of positive relationship is often uh, at the heart a matter of uh, people identifying with each other, cooperating even-handedly, and going out of their way to try to uh, help one another. Um, uh, and so it does a good job of capturing the meaninglessness of destruction and harm and isolation from others. The trouble with the communal theory uh, is that it does a, has a hard time capturing the idea that it's possible to have meaning just in oneself. Mm -hmm. So even if one were alone, I think uh, uh, one could have a life that was more meaningful than just that of the sunbather. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, if one uh, uh, were courageous uh, uh, or overcame uh, uh, mental illnesses such as addiction, I think those would be sources of meaning in life. But doesn't look like essentially they're bound up with relating to other people. Mm -hmm. So I think of the two, uh, the vitality theory is more attractive and, uh, because it can say if you are addicted, you are have less uh, vital force, you're not as strong, mm -hmm. uh, you're dependent on this drug, uh, for example. Um, or a courageous person is going to exhibit strength in the face of, of, of uh, uh, things she's scared of. Um, and we can spread our vitality and thereby help others uh, 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 have more energy or liveliness in their lives. And so of the two theories, uh, the vitality theory looks attractive, um, but it has a difficult time capturing uh, a firm intuition of mine, and that's the relevance of certain kinds of knowledge for meaning in life. So I think if you know yourself more, uh, there's some more meaning to be had by virtue of that, but it might not make you any more strong. It might weaken you, in fact. You might get depressed uh, once you come to understand yourself better. Um, and it might make you grumpier, and uh, you might have a harder time relating to other people uh, communally. And then I think knowledge of the human species and knowledge of the universe we live in, I think these can also be good for their own sake. Uh, they can be important kinds of knowledge to discover and to learn about. Um, but I don't think that their, va their value comes from facilitating cohesion between people or uh, in enhancing liveliness at all. Mm -hmm. So what this means is that uh, we might want a kind of cross-cultural inquiry into meaning. Um, uh, the tradition, the objections I've made uh, to the African theories are characteristically Western uh, mm -hmm. objections. Mm -hmm. right? They go back as far as Aristotle, uh, mm -hmm. the thought that one needs yeah. one's rational nature needs to be in control of one's passions, mm -hmm. uh, and that there's something special uh, about theoretical wisdom, learning about the heavens. Um, so it might be the African tradition has something to learn from the Western, but uh, conversely, uh, this notion of vital force and creative dynamic energy um, uh, is something that's not common in Western thought about uh, the meaning of life, mm -hmm. and I think the African tradition has that to contribute. 
over time, I would like to see more and more traditions speaking to each other mm -hmm. and having these kinds of, of critical discussions mm -hmm. where they don't merely compare each other, but they grapple with places where they clash, yes. right? where they disagree. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the future uh, yes. of thinking yeah, about, yes, I think so too. about meaning in life. Yeah. Um, do do the African pe and traditional African people think that you know there are, there is an exchange of vitality between humans and animals and humans and between you know and plants yes. and ecosystems? Yes. So yes. if you if you eat the plant or you eat the animal, you gain its uh -huh. you gain its vital force. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And traditionally speaking, that was understood in terms of an, an imperceptible energy that came mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. But we can understand it without that metaphysics if we choose. Mm -hmm. I think there's something still attractive about an appeal to life mm -hmm. uh, as a source of meaning, uh, mm -hmm. even if it isn't wrapped up in a supernatural uh, uh, garb. Okay. Um, in we um, but even in Western um, contemporary, so there are, uh, for example, um, what about the deep ecology? Deep ecology. Uh, I think uh, deep ecology. The word deep ecology was uh, created by Arunenes, mm -hmm. the way a way of thinker. So um, I feel that kind of you know the in the thought of deep ecology, they think that they, you know um, we are humans, but we humans have um, very deep co uh, connections with the ecosystems or the earth as a whole. So they find. Uh, uh, yeah, this kind of you know vital exchange, exchange of vitality, um, those um, interspecies connections. Um, this kind of um, ideas are very um, lies at the cent center of their um, ecological thought. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what, what do you think about you know the, this um, this kind of similarity between Western um, e ecologists? And traditional African vitalism. Oh, I think there's. I think there are similarities. Mm -hmm. um, so in the African tradition, uh, uh, in the vitalist tradition and strain of it in particular, uh, it would be natural for adherents to that view to say that well, some things in nature are worth mm -hmm. more than others, mm -hmm. and the animals have more vitality, uh, more power, more strength than plants, and so it's particularly important. Mm -hmm to engage with them uh, in some way. Um, uh, and I have some sympathies uh, mm. with that kind of approach. But from the communal perspective, uh, what some African philosophers have said is it's important not merely to uh, relate positively and share with other human beings, mm. uh, but with other parts of nature and perhaps with, with ecosystems. Mm. Um, and so uh, instead of the word uh, community or communalism, sometimes you'll find talk of harmony and harmony uh, between humans and the natural world. Uh, and that's a very common thought uh, in African ethics and African environmentalism. Um, and so there is some overlap there uh, uh, with deep ecology and again with other traditions in yes. East Asia and also Latin America. Yes, yes. Okay, so I think we have exceeded our time limit. <laughs> we ran out of time, so thank you very much. And uh, I forget to uh, tell the audience that this is Waseda Bear, the mascot of Waseda University. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>